Okay, we're working now, Marty. All right, so this I normally teach this. What we're, you're about to learn is normally taught in either one eight-hour course or twelve hours. So you're going to get it in an hour. Okay, so this is the condensed version. So we'll talk some more about this, but I want to cover the basics with you guys. Okay, what we're going to talk about for a few minutes is the roots of the real property system in the United States. You need to understand some of the history. Okay, so we're going to go all the way back to England. We're going to talk about a king that set this whole system up. Okay, because we inherited English common law. Okay, common law is the law the courts make. Okay. So if it's not written in statute, in other words, if it's not passed by the legislature, then it's governed by common law, judge-made law is what they call it. Okay? We inherited our court, our common law, our judge-made law, we inherited from England, because we started as what? 13 English colonies, right? Okay, then we're going to talk about land title insurance. What is it? Why do we have it? We're going to talk about what a land title report is, and then we're going to talk about a land title survey. In order to understand number four, which is going to be a, the majority of our work, you have to understand the first three. That's why I'm starting at the top. Okay? So, a long time ago, don't ask me when, but it was a long time ago, the French, the French and the English didn't like each other. Okay? The English were called Saxons, and the French were called Normans. Okay? So they fought all the time, the French and the English. Okay? So there was a, a French king. He was called William the Conqueror. Okay? And he invaded England. And he basically kicked butt. Okay? So he conquered all of England. Okay? And so when he was done raping and pillaging his way across the English countryside, he basically said, I'm taking all the land in England. And he just took it. He took it at the tip of a sword. Okay? And so he handed that land out to the knights that fought with him as a reward for their service. Okay? That's called the feudal system. So there's a couple reasons why that's important. First of all, under the English system, who ultimately owns all the land? The king. The king, the sovereign. Okay? So he started out with all the land, okay, and in, in the way that system worked, let's say Danny was one of my knights. So I'm William the Cocker, I give Danny a thousand acres in England, okay. When he died, guess what happened to that land? It went back. Came back to me, and then I could give it to somebody else. And if I didn't like Danny's son, guess what? His son was screwed, because I'd turn around and hand that land to somebody else. And while Danny had the land, he owed me... He owed me taxes, which could either be money or he'd have to provide a certain number of knights whenever I needed them. Okay? That was the deal. Okay? So he'd swear loyal to me, loyalty to me and he'd either give me knights or pay me taxes. When he died, I got the land back. Okay, now here's what happened throughout English history. Okay? Kings would get themselves into trouble because they were hotheads and they'd go to war and they'd get themselves in trouble and then they'd have to negotiate with the nobles. And so over time, the king got less and less power over that land, and the nobles got more and more power over the land. Okay, So one of the first things the nobles did, and I forget which English king it was, but some English king got himself in trouble, and he went to the nobles and he said, I need more help. And the nobles said, that's fine, but from now on, the land that you give us automatically passes to our heirs. It's not going back to you anymore. That was one of the very first things they, that was a right they got from the king. Okay, And then a little, little later on, they said, hey, we're not giving you, we're not sending our sons to die in your wars anymore. We'll pay you taxes, but we're not giving you knights. Because that used to be your son. We'd go and fight for the king. Okay, so over time, the king had less and less power over the land. And more and more power went to the landowners. Okay? Okay, so fast forward to the United States. The 13 colonies grant independence. Get independence. Win independence from Britain. Okay? But there's these huge tracts of land. The Louisiana Purchase and some other, you know, there's these huge tracts of land. And all that land started out being owned by who? Indians. No, well, yeah, the Indians really owned it. But, yeah, <laughs> under the white man system, who owned all the, king, all the land originally under the English system? The king. The king. Okay, now this is important. If you were in the, so a couple important things. Let me, let me backtrack a little bit. 
So in England, England had what they called a paper title system. So it didn't matter who occupied the land. If you didn't have a piece of paper signed from the king saying that was your land, you were screwed. So it was a paper title system. Okay? You had to have the piece of paper from the king or, you, or it was not your land. Okay? That's a paper title system. Okay? The Roman system was a little bit different. Under Roman law, the, the individual that occupied and used the land was the valid owner. So if you left your land vacant, abandoned, and somebody moved in, a squatter moved in and started using that land under the Roman system, they could get rights to your land. That's a system based on occupation, not on per paper title. Okay? So there was a difference. Okay? So in England, it wasn't like that. It was a paper title system. You had to have a piece of paper from the king. Okay, fast forward to the United States. We get all this land as we expand westward, right? From Mexico, from Spain, from France, okay, from Russia. We get all these vast grants of land. All that land to begin with was owned by the United States federal government, the sovereign, okay? And so they were trying to settle the west, okay? So what they would do is they would give, they actually, in the, in, the, in the early days, they would actually give you land. If you promised to move out west and settle on the land, they would give you land, okay? They also owed the soldiers from the Revolutionary War a bunch of money, but the, but the, the federal government, the early United States government, didn't have money. We didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of what? So the way they paid those soldiers off was they gave them land out west, and the soldier would either move out and sell that land, or he would sell it to another settler. Okay, that's how we paid off our soldiers a lot of our war debt. Okay, but here's the key: the key thing, just under, just like under England, the very first deed to a piece of land in the United States has to come from where? The king, from the U.S. government, and there's a special name for that deed. It's called a patent. A government patent. Okay, and we're not going to talk about. So they also came up with a system to divvy that land up. It was called the Public Land Survey System. We're not going to talk about it today. We will. We'll do some. We'll do another class on that. But just remember, the patent is the very first deed. Okay, and it says from the U.S. to gain some piece of land. Okay. Now. Real quick, let's talk about the types of deeds. Okay, so the pa a patent is one type of deed. Okay, then there's two other kinds of deeds that we typically deal with. Okay, there's what they call a grant deed or a warranty deed. Okay, and then there's what they call a quick claim deed, and I'm going to explain the difference. Okay, but let's talk about why. We need to talk for a few minutes about why land is tricky, okay? So listen, we've, we've come up with this whole system to deal with the, the fact that owning land is tricky. So I'm going to explain why. Okay, under the common law, for everything essentially except for land and automobiles, our system is based on possession, like the Romans. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example to help you understand. Have you guys ever heard the expression, possession is nine-tenths of the law? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the common law. It comes from the Roman system. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example. And there's a good reason why it's that way. This right here is a $700 chair. Brand new is $1,200. Okay, I bought it used for $700. It's the nicest chair you'll ever sit in. Okay, so I paid for this chair. It's on my credit card. Okay, but let's say Danny's sitting in this chair. He comes over here, I bought him over for lunch, and he sits in my chair. And he says, you know what, I like this chair, I'm taking it with me. Okay, so he's getting ready to take it out to load his truck. And I call Stockton PD. And I say, Danny's stealing my chair. And they send a patrol car out here. Okay? And I say, Danny's stealing my chair, he's putting it in his truck. And the cop tells Danny, hey, is that Landon's chair? And Danny says, no, it's my chair. You know what the cop's going to tell me? Go to court. Who's in possession? Oh. Danny's in possession, and it's not a car, and it's not land, it's not real property, okay? So the cop's going to tell me, it's a civil matter, Danny's in possession. Go to court. Go to court. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. Wow. But that makes sense, because otherwise, what would people be doing all the time? Saying it's theirs. Yeah, when it's not. And that's ridiculous, right? So, like, the, who, the incentive is, what do you got to do with your personal property? Keep it. Protect it. 
right? Okay, but there's two things basically in the American system that we don't do that way. That we say, hey, possession is not enough. You have to have paper title. Two things, land and cars. Why cars? That's just an easy one, like too easy. For... Okay, there's a reason why we do it Plus for cars. the amount? Is okay, the amount? it's the dollar value of the asset. Okay. okay, what are the two most expensive thing, things most Americans own? Land and... Their house and their car. Mm -hmm. So for those two things, and there may be others, but for those, basically for your average American, those are the two most expensive assets we have, and under our legal system, you got to have paper title. So let's go back to that illustration. Let's say Danny's leaving the house today, and he says, man, that's a really nice Dodge Ram Eco Diesel land has got sitting in his driveway, and he grabs my key, and he jumps in, and he drives in Oakdale. And I call Stockton PD, and I say, Danny stole my truck. Okay? Well, they'll be able to tell because it's registered. Yeah, so they're going to drive to Danny's house. They're going to see my car. They're going to look up online, and they're going to say, hey, Landon's got paper title to that truck. And they're going to handcuff Danny, and they're going to take him to jail. Okay? Because I have paper title. And in our system, it doesn't matter if Danny has physical occupation if I have paper title to the car. Okay? Now, there's a couple things you have to do with the paper title system. So, under a paper, and this is important, you'll see in a minute, under a paper title system, you have to uniquely identify the asset that is being owned. So, how do we do that with vehicles? A VIN number. We do a VIN. So, there's the VIN number on your door, the VIN number on your dash, and then there's a couple VINs. Inside the parts. Yeah, they're stamped on the engine block, and then there's usually one VIN, they don't tell you where it's at. Okay? There's apparently VINs on every part, so you can see if the car's been in an yeah. accident. So, we stamp a unique number on a car, because we want to be able to uniquely identify it. Because you might have more than one silver four-wheel drive eco diesel in Stockton, right? Okay, so you got to be able to uniquely identify it. Okay? And you got to be able to tell one car from the other. Okay, which sounds silly, but like, okay, so if I sell Danny, if Danny comes to my house to, to look at my truck, I'm selling my eco diesel, and I got a boat and a boat trailer hooked up to it, okay, what's the potential problem there? Danny buys the truck. I'm taking the boat and the boat trailer. Yeah, it? does that include the boat and the boat trailer? Well, that's why if you, what, a boat's got a separate what? Title. Separate title, separate VIN. So, no, Danny, you didn't buy the boat. You bought the truck. Okay, now. Let's build on that example a little bit. You'll see why this becomes such a problem with land. So in land is also has a paper title system. Okay, but there's two tricky things about land that are way easier to do with automobiles. So the first is, how do you uniquely identify a piece of land? Parcel. That's hard to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Wait, are you going to stamp something concrete on the ground? Like, it, it's tricky to just uniquely describe land, right? Uniquely identify land. 